Good evening, let's bow our heads to pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have spoken through your living word, the Bible, by your Holy Spirit. Help each one of us to hear that word now. In Jesus' name, amen. What do you think of your parents? We all have a different uh, experience of family life, but it is an important question. What do you really think of your parents? My own father died a few years ago. The more I think about him, the more amazed I am at all that he did for me. I must admit, it took me many years to realize that I owed him anything. I all too easily took him and all that he did for me for granted. How much more is that true of God, our Heavenly Father? So easily we lose sight of his love and his amazing grace towards us. Now, in our journey through Paul's letter to the Galatians, we have, of course, arrived at chapter 4. From slavery to freedom is our theme. We're going to major on, we're looking at the whole chapter, but we're going to major on those first seven verses that um, we've just uh, heard from Andrew. And uh, we'll have a quick look at the rest of the chapter. So do please have that open in front of you. Galatians 4, page 974 in the Bibles. So what is God saying here through his messenger Paul to those Christians in the church of Galatia and to us? Well, my first heading is this. We were enslaved. Simple as that. We were enslaved. We will never understand and appreciate what God the Father does for us, has done for us, if we don't realize what it is he's rescuing us from. So take a look at verses 1 to 3 of chapter 4, which go like this. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. So he's talking about humanity without Christ. We were enslaved, says the Apostle Paul, But what is the nature of this slavery to which we were subject until God the Father sent his Son? Well, first of all, we were in bondage to the law of God. Chapter 4, verse 5 says that God sent his Son to redeem those who were under the law. And back in chapter 3, verse 23, he describes how we were held captive under the law, imprisoned. Now, this is God's law that he's talking about, so don't take this the wrong way. As Matt showed us last week, the law in itself is not a bad thing. Paul makes this perfectly plain in chapter 3, verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. The law was like a guardian, he says, a trustee. It was God's way of protecting us and preparing us until he sent his son. But the effects of the law of God are twofold. It shows us our sin and it makes clear the hopelessness of our own attempts to justify ourselves before God. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We do all we can to spruce ourselves up and get rid of the dirt and look immaculate and smart. But the light of God's law shines bright on our lives. And it shows us to be standing there in filthy rags. And worse than that, it shows us to be living under the curse of death. Back to chapter 3, verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law 
are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. We don't and we can't obey God's law perfectly. So we were under the law, slaves to the law, dirty and damned. Secondly, Paul says, chapter 4, verse 3, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. What does that mean? It could again refer to the law, but it's a phrase that has two aspects and an alternative translation would be we were in slavery under the elemental spirits of the universe. If your eyesight is good and you can, you can see that uh, in the note at the foot of the page, elemental spirits. That fits with verse uh, 8. Formerly when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. In other words, Paul is looking beyond the old covenant law now to a more comprehensive kind of slavery, the slavery of idolatry. We find ourselves under the authority of forces and powers that are far more than we can handle. And behind them lies all the lie all the evil spirits that make up the army of our deadly enemy, Satan. But idolatry comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Sinful relationships become vice-like in their grip and it becomes impossible to escape them. Desires that we naively thought we controlled control us and become addictive. When we get what we want or what others tell us we should want, it never satisfies and we always want more. The powers of evil get their teeth into us. At first something may seem so exciting, but then the trap shuts and we have no way out. When you did not know God, you were enslaved, says the apostle. And what devastation this slavery causes. One of the podcasts I'm listening to is Justin Briley's The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. I recommend it. The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. And he says in one of those episodes, so we're living in the midst of a mental health crisis, which seems to stem from an identity crisis and which may ultimately be a spiritual crisis. A recent UK survey reveals the scale of the problem in our culture. Nine in ten young Brits aged 16 to 29 responded that their life lacks purpose or meaning. And he goes on, we are self-medicating distracting ourselves to death with technology and material things, yet a form of hedonistic nihilism has settled into many parts of our culture. Or as the apostle says, when you did not know God, you were enslaved. But the good news is that we were not left there, lost and hopeless Which brings me to my next heading. So secondly, we have been set free and adopted by God the Father through his Son. Verses 4 and 5 of chapter 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Christians, says Paul, have two great things to rejoice in. We are redeemed and we are adopted. First of all, we are redeemed. That was the first part of the work that Jesus was sent by his Father to do, to buy us back from that slavery, to rescue us from the trap of sin 
and the grip of idolatry and the curse of condemnation. The Son of God, sinless as he is, put himself under the law and under its curse to set us free from that curse. Back to chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He paid the price of humiliation, suffering, death, and hell so that we could go free from all that. Jesus has done what it takes to rescue us from that slavery. And he did that in order to open the way for us to be adopted. And that's the second thing Paul says Christians can rejoice in. We are redeemed and we are adopted as sons of God into the Father's family. Now you may wonder why Paul speaks of us And he does in a quite particular way why he speaks of us becoming sons of God. Why not daughters as well? One thing to say is that generally the term is inclusive, as is clear from 3.28. We looked at that last time. Though there are differences between men and women, when it comes to relating to God the Father, there is none. There is no male and female in Christ. But in this case, it is in fact appropriate to speak even of women becoming sons of God, and that is for two reasons. First of all, we are adopted into God's family by being united with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, through faith in him. There is no other way to the Father but through the Son, whether male or female, we identify with him the Son. Secondly, we're all sons in the sense that we all share equally in the inheritance that in the ancient world would have gone to the male child. There is no male and female when it comes to the children of God inheriting all that their heavenly Father has in store for them. As verse 7 says, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. We're not by nature sons of God. By nature we are slaves. But God sent his son, verse 5, so that we might receive adoption as sons. This is God the Father's great gift to those who believe, to those who cling to Christ like a shipwrecked sailor clings to the winch man lowered from the air sea rescue helicopter. In the words of 3.26, in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So we were in slavery, but God the Father sent his son to die for us so that through faith in him we could be adopted into his family. How then does that affect our lives? That question brings me to my next heading. So thirdly, we have been given the Holy Spirit to live in freedom as God's sons. So look at verses 6 and 7. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. What is the effect of becoming a child of God? It transforms our lives, both now and forever. J.I. Packer describes a test of whether we know what it means to be a Christian. He says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, means he doesn't understand Christianity very well. Adoption, he says, is the highest privilege 
that the gospel offers. As children of God, we can at any time share our needs and our fears, our hopes and joys directly with the Lord of the universe. He is our Abba, our Father. That's how great our privilege is. So as we begin to rely on Jesus, we are redeemed, we are adopted, and we can rejoice that we've been given the Holy Spirit. As verse 6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. It is the Spirit of God who brings us alive to all that it means to have God for our Father. Before God comes into our lives by his Spirit, we are spiritually dead. The Spirit gives us life and enables us to understand what God has done and teaches us to talk to him as our Father. So if we have received Christ into our lives and believed in him, then we can rejoice in where we are today. We are redeemed We are adopted and we have been given the Spirit of God. But the future holds even more in store for us. Verse 7 again. So you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. The sons of God are fellow heirs with Christ. The future destiny of every child of God is clear. And that makes all the difference to our perspective on what happens to us in the meantime. We have a hope that is not wishful thinking. It is a guaranteed certainty because it's been promised by God our Father and he keeps his promises. And what we we have a share in is the glory of Christ. Everything he has will be shared with us. What will that be like? We don't know the details. We don't need to. It will be a family gathering, face to face with the Father and with Jesus. In Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan's Mr. Steadfast stands halfway into the waters of the River Jordan and he says, I see myself at the end of my journey. My toilsome days are ended. The thought of what I'm going to And of the conduct that waits for me on the other side doth lie as a glowing coal at my heart. I have formerly lived by hearsay and faith, but now I go where I shall live by sight and shall be with him in whose company I delight myself. We will never understand the life of faith unless we keep our eternal inheritance in Jesus at the front of our minds. So, what does all this mean for us? Well, we're coming from different perspectives as we listen to this. Maybe you know full well that you have been rescued by Christ out of slavery to sin, idolatry, evil, and death. Maybe you learned it from your parents maybe by some other route. But you have taken it to heart for yourself. So when the Bible talks about God sending the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, your own heart leaps in recognition. You know what he's talking about. You are confident of your own eternal destiny. And if that's so, let's be grateful to God, our Father. Don't take God's goodness and grace for granted like the privileged child who never says thank you to his dad. Give thanks to God with the whole of your life. Maybe on the other hand, whatever your parents tried to teach you, you've lost sight of the fact that you are a child of God. You've wandered from the family home into which you were adopted. You've neglected your privileges and ignored your heavenly father. Or have you lost sight of the fact that you are a child of God by grace, through faith? Have you started to think that you do have to climb some kind of long ladder to heaven and to God's approval by keeping a raft of rules? 
That's what the Galatians were being told, and they were in severe danger of listening to the voices that were telling them that to achieve their salvation, they had to add old covenant rule keeping to their faith in Christ. So then in verses 8 to 20, Paul pleads with them and he pleads with us not to throw away their freedom in Christ. He is deeply distressed about what they're doing. Verses 19 to 20, my little children, I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I am perplexed about you. Why would they want to be slaves again? Why were they no longer listening to his God-given gospel? So he says in verse 9, How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? And in verse 16, Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? And then to drive his point home, he gives a beautiful illustration in verses 21 to 31. To get to grips with it requires careful contemplation, and we don't have time for the details now. It's a passage that would repay your close attention later. But to show the great gulf that there is between law and grace as the means of salvation... Paul draws out the contrast between the two sons of Abraham. Ishmael, born of his slave woman Hagar, and Isaac, born of his wife Sarah. So he is using the law itself in the form of the first five books of the Bible where this account is found in Genesis. He's using the law to show that even according to the law, Our salvation is not by law, but by God's free gift of grace. Abraham and Sarah had used Hagar horribly to try and force God's hand out of a failure of faith. And so Ishmael was born. But their son Isaac was a gift of grace promised by God who keeps his promises. And we, says Paul, are not Ishmael's, but Isaac's, children of promise, born again by grace through faith for freedom. And so he ends the chapter, verse 31, so brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. And by way of a preview, he cries out at the start of chapter 5, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Hold fast to Paul's God-given gospel of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. And if you are one of those who has lost sight of that and started listening to other voices, then listen to the apostles cry and come home again. The door is always open to the child of God. It's just a matter of saying, Father, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'm home again. And this time it's for good. Please take me in. And he will. Maybe on the other hand it's dawning on you that far from being free, you have always lived your life in slavery. You have never known what it is to be a child of God. But now you're starting to see that another life is possible. And God the Father is inviting you, come in out of the cold, trust me, leave the chains of your slavery behind, become a part of my family. Everything I have will be yours as well. 
And how will you respond? Will you give no reply, but turn your back and walk away into the darkness? Or will you step over the threshold? However timid and out of your depth you may feel, will you say to God, yes, please. I know I don't deserve it, but I believe that your son, Jesus, has died for me so that I can become your child. For the first time in my life, I'm coming home. Please take me in. If that's what you say to God the Father this evening, it's only the beginning, but it is the beginning of a new life for you. Tell a Christian friend you've made that new start. Ask them to give you a hand as you learn to live by faith, to have God as your Father, to be redeemed and adopted into his family through Jesus and to be given his spirit so you can talk to him and live for him. Let's bow our heads to pray. Our Heavenly Father, Abba Father, we thank you that through your Son, Jesus, you have opened the way for us to become your sons and heirs. Give us your Holy Spirit so that we might know that privilege both today and for all eternity. Amen.